Hello everyone, welcome to Business School 101. GDP is one of the most common tools used to track the health of a nation's economy. If you often watch business news, you might hear economists and politicians discuss GDP quite often. But what exactly does it mean? How is GDP calculated and why is it so important? Today I'm going to answer those questions for you. In addition, I will introduce three other indicators that are also frequently used to evaluate and compare the economic development of various countries. Now, let's start with GDP. Gross domestic product, or GDP, refers to the total monetary or market value of all the finished goods and services produced within a country's borders during a specific time period. Economists use GDP to measure the relative wealth and prosperity of different nations as well as to measure the overall growth or decline of a nation's economy. Each country prepares and publishes its own GDP data regularly. Additionally, international organizations such as the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund periodically publish and maintain historical GDP data for many countries. In the United States, GDP data is published quarterly by the Bureau of Economic Analysis of the U.S. Department of Commerce. GDP can be determined via three primary methods which are often called the expenditure approach, the output approach, and the income approach. With the expenditure approach, GDP is calculated by C plus I plus G plus NX. Here, C refers to the total domestic consumption or the total amount spent on domestically produced final goods and services. This is anything a household or individual would spend money on, like non-durable goods, such as food, clothing, and so on. I refers to the total domestic investment expenditures, which include not only investments in stocks and bonds, but also investments in equipment such as computers and commercial buildings, which will be useful over a long period of time. G refers to government expenditures. These include any physical products the government has purchased, like fire trucks or aircraft carriers, investments the government has made, and salaries of government employees, such as salaries of judges, police officers, and teachers in public schools and colleges. However, government expenditures don't include any payments or programs like welfare or social security. NX refers to net exports. This means the total of goods and services produced domestically and sold to foreign countries minus goods and services produced by foreign countries that are sold domestically. Here is a pie chart of the typical distribution of America's GDP. As you can see, consumer spending contributes almost 70% of the total GDP. The business investments and government expenditures normally contribute 15 to 20%. Additionally, it is important to note that the U.S. normally has a trade deficit. This means that the cost of a country's imports exceeds the value of its exports. So the net exports for America are usually between negative 3 to negative 5%. Now we understand how GDP is calculated, but how does it affect us? Simply put, if GDP is growing, then the government will use it as evidence to say that they are doing a good job of managing the economy. Likewise, if it falls, Opposing politicians will say the government is running the economy badly. Additionally, GDP helps governments decide how much they can spend on public services and how much they need to raise taxes. If GDP steadily increases, people will pay more taxes simply because they're earning and spending more. This means more money for the government to spend on public services, such as schools, police, and hospitals. Although GDP is one of the most widely used tools to measure a country's economy, it doesn't tell the whole story. That's why we're going to learn about some of the major drawbacks of GDP. First, GDP doesn't include the underground economy. The underground economy refers to cash and barter transactions that are not formally recorded in GDP and are often used to support the trade of illegal goods and services. The scale of underground economies varies greatly between nations and, in some cases, they make up a substantial percentage of a country's economic output. The underground market is almost impossible to estimate or value, and due to its illegal nature, it is rarely incorporated into a nation's published GDP figure. Therefore, some nations' economic outputs may be understated by GDP. Second, GDP fails to indicate environmental abuses. As we know, producers can increase their output by polluting or damaging the environment. 
In developed countries, production is better regulated and companies that violate environmental laws can face severe fines and penalties. However, many developing economies rely on high output to support the growth of their own economies and are less concerned with environmental issues. Nonetheless, there is a consensus that such environmental damage should be counted against a country's GDP since it is not sustainable production and may impact future growth. Third, GDP doesn't demonstrate income distribution or standard of living. GDP growth doesn't tell us how income is split across the population. Rising GDP could result from the rich getting richer rather than everyone becoming better off. In other words, a disproportionate share of a nation's income can be earned by a small minority of households. For example, when the top 10% of households earn 80% of the total income in a country, there is a high degree of income inequality. Additionally, just because GDP is increasing doesn't mean that a citizen's standard of living is improving. If a country's population increases, then GDP will grow because with more people, more money will be spent. However, the individuals within that country might not be getting richer. In fact, they may be getting poorer on average even while GDP goes up. Lastly, GDP doesn't care if products made in a certain country are made by that country. GDP only looks at the value of goods and services produced within a country's borders. It does not care whether or not those values are created by that country's own citizens or companies. For example, even if a country has a decent GDP, but most of the GDP is produced by foreign individuals or companies, then the GDP can't truly represent the financial standing of that country's own citizens or businesses. To address GDP's limitations, economists sometimes use three other indexes to track and compare the economic development of various countries. First, GDP per capita. GDP per capita is a metric that breaks down a country's economic output per person. It is calculated by dividing the GDP of a country by its population. Here are the top 10 countries with the highest GDP in the world for 2020. As you can see, this chart includes some traditional developed countries, such as the United States, Japan, and Germany. Interestingly, we can also see some developing countries, such as China, India, and Brazil. However, if we take a closer look and consider the influence of the population, we can deduce that even though the developing countries have fairly large GDP overall, their GDP per capita are much lower than the developed countries. For example, although China has become the second largest economy in the world since 2010, its GDP per capita was less than one-sixth of America's GDP per capita in 2020. Similarly, India, which is ranked number five in national GDP, its GDP per capita is less than one-thirtieth of America's GDP per capita. Nevertheless, I believe it is still worth pointing out that the developing countries caught up very fast in terms of their economic development at the global level. In fact, based on the current growth rate, many economists across the world predict that China will surpass the U.S. to become the largest economy in the world within the next decade. India will also take the third position by that time. Beside GDP and GDP per capita, gross national income, or GNI, is another measure of national wealth. GNI is the value of all income produced by a country's residents within its geographical borders, plus net receipts of income from abroad. In short, GNI is a measure of all money, goods, services, and investments that enter and stay in a country. The formula for calculating GNI is often represented as GNI equals C plus I plus G plus NX plus NFFI. Because the first four factors also represent GDP, G and I can also be calculated as G and I equals GDP plus NFFI. NFFI refers to net foreign factor income, which is what citizens earn abroad minus the income that foreign residents earn in a country and send out of a country. In an increasingly global economy, GNI has been put forward as a potentially better metric for overall economic health than GDP. Because certain countries have most of their income withdrawn abroad by foreign corporations and individuals, 
their GDP figures are much higher than the figures that represent their GNI. For example, in 2018, Luxembourg's GDP was $70.9 billion, while its GNI was $45.1 billion. This discrepancy was due to large payments made to the rest of the world via foreign corporations that did business with Luxembourg, which were attracted by the tiny nation's favorable tax laws. Contrarily, GNI and GDP don't differ substantially in the U.S. In 2018, the U.S. GDP was $20.6 trillion, while its GNI was $20.8 trillion. Third, HDI. Both GDP and GNI are used to evaluate and rank a nation's economic development. However, as we all know, financial wealth cannot tell the whole picture of our quality of life. There are many other factors such as life expectancy and education that are considered critical to a country's social welfare. To address this limitation, the Human Development Index, or HDI, was created to emphasize that people and their capabilities should be the ultimate criteria for assessing the development of a country, not economic growth alone. The HDI is an indicator that focuses specifically on people and their capabilities to assess the development and welfare of a nation. It is comprised of three indexes. First, the Life Expectancy Index, based on life expectancy at birth, which is a function of healthcare. Second, Educational Attainment, which is measured by a combination of the adult literacy rate and enrollment in primary, secondary, and tertiary education. Third, the Income Index, based on gross national income per capita by purchasing parity, which considers whether or not average incomes are sufficient to meet the basic needs of life in a country, like adequate food, shelter, and health care. Together, these three indexes provide an indication of a person's capabilities and well-being. They provide a bigger picture of progress than GDP and GNI. According to the United Nations, the HDI is scaled from 0 to 1. Countries scoring less than 0.5 are classified as having low human development. Those scoring from 0.5 to 0.7 are classified as having medium human development. Scores from 0.7 to 0.8 are classified as having high human development, and those that score above 0.8 are classified as having very high human development. Here is the HDI index for the top 10 largest economies in the world for 2020. As you can see, the HDI for all developed countries listed in the table are classified as very high. Developing countries such as China and Brazil are classified as high, while India is classified as medium. Now, let's do a quick review of today's topic. GDP stands for Gross Domestic Product. It is used as a reference point for the health of national economies. It is calculated by adding these four figures together, personal consumption, private investment, government spending, and net exports. Although GDP is one of the most widely used tools to measure a country's economy, it suffers from several major limitations. First, GDP doesn't include the underground economy. Second, GDP fails to indicate environmental abuses. Third, GDP doesn't demonstrate income distribution or standard of living. Lastly, GDP doesn't care if products made in a certain country are made by that country. To address the limitations of GDP, we learned about three alternate indexes that reflect a nation's wealth and social well-being. GDP per capita is a metric that breaks down a country's economic output per person and is calculated by dividing the GDP of a country by its population. Gross national income, or GNI, is the value of all incomes produced by a country's residents, including both citizens and foreign residents, within its geographical borders, plus net receipts of income such as wages, salary, and property income from abroad. Finally, the Human Development Index, also known as HDI, is an indicator that specifically focuses on people and their capabilities to assess the development and welfare of a country. Unlike GDP and GNI, HDI not only takes the economic factor into account, but also includes life expectancy and educational attainment, which provides a richer picture of a country's social welfare. So, what do you think about the impact of GDP? Which index did you find to be the most helpful? Please leave your thoughts in a comment below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.